It's now my uh, additional great honor to introduce uh, my wonderful friend, uh, Walter Gilliam. And the shortest and truest introduction I can make for Walter is to say that he is a gentleman and he is a scholar. And that is not a throwaway line. Uh, that's who Walter is. Um, I mentioned before that the Buffett family decided to create a foundation to invest. The plan was to invest in the smartest possible uh, kind of change at the beginning of the 21st century. And what would be the smartest investment in public education at the beginning of the 21st century? Um, and by then, thanks to neurons, to neighborhoods, and all those Newsweek covers, it was clear enough to me that the smartest area of investment was the earliest years. And so I knew we were going to have a wonderful opportunity of having what became $30 million a year to spend the private money uh, in whatever the smartest investment turned out to be. And one of the very first places I went in 2001 was to uh, Yale University to visit uh, with a man named uh, Ed Ziegler and a man named Walter Gilliam. Ed, is still alive in his 80s, and he is one of the founding giants of Head Start. Uh, and Walter, uh, since Ed's not here, I will tell you, is his smarter and better looking younger brother. <laughs> uh, Walter has um, done so much work on uh, figuring out uh, what works most effectively uh, to create school readiness in the United States. He has led national uh, evaluations of state-funded pre-K programs. Um, he has looked very deeply into the birth to five space and uh, from the standpoint not of an economist but of uh, someone uh, very versed in psychology and psychiatry, uh, what works. And all of these disciplines have lessons uh, to tell us. Walter's perhaps, uh, he should be famous for many things. One of the things for which he's most famous is revealing the extent to which children uh, in preschools across the United States are expelled. And if you think about the um, social cruelty of managing behavior through expulsion at the age of three, and then you look at how those expulsions are distributed, um, it's quite a story of which I know Walter will tell you. Uh, Walter uh, advises uh, state governments and uh, important uh, players in the federal government on what uh, policy should be. He is the director of the Edward Ziegler Center on uh, uh, Child Development and Public Policy at Yale. Uh, and he's also the director of the Yale um, China program in child development. Um, we've heard a lot today about uh, intergenerational mobility um, and rising from poverty. I'm going to take the liberty of letting you know that last night Walter told me a lot about his childhood in the coal country of eastern Kentucky. Um, and if you want to know uh, about intergenerational mobility, think about the fact that Walter grew up in one of the poorest parts of the United States. And when the royal family of Abu Dhabi wanted to uh, figure out uh, how to build a, an exemplary early childhood center, uh, who, did, who did they ask? Whom did they ask to come advise them? It was Walter Gilliam. Walter has, um, he has these things. He has um, a blazing curiosity and wit. He has a passionate heart. Um, and he has a deep sense of personal humility. And uh, I would submit to you that that combination is pretty rare. And it's also the recipe for a gentleman and a scholar. I give you Walter Hill. Dan and I have been very good friends for 
for many years, and he's been so kind as to facilitate the introduction for me to be able to come here and talk to you today, and I've been able to meet other good friends, friends of Anne's, who now I think are friends of mine, so thank you so much, Anne, for everything, all for all of those, all of those years. Uh, so, um, first off, it's a, it's a thrill to be here today and talking to you here about uh, early care and education programs, and about language development, put a little bit of thought into try, in trying to figure out exactly what to say to you and how this would be. And of course, as Dan was telling me earlier, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the position of, of having to bat to clean up. Um, and so some of the slides you'll see here may look familiar from just a few <laughs> moments ago. <laughs> but I'll, what I'll try to do is I'll try to put a little bit of a different spin on it or, or show it to you from a, from a somewhat different perspective as we go forward. One of the things that I particularly loved about this this, um, this symposium here is the title that was given to it, uh, Childhood Literacy as a Public Health and Economic Imperative. Uh, what do we know and what do we need to do? Now, of course, if this were a symposium that was, that was hosted by just researchers, it, the end would probably say something like, what do we need to know and, and, and what, what do we know and what do we need to know and why we need more research funding? <laughs> that's, that's probably, if it were like, like a research kind of, kind, of, kind of conference, but this is not a research, this is a, this is a doing conference, and so, and so I, uh, I particularly appreciated seeing that ending there. I'm going to tell you quickly, if I were to summarize the past four or five decades of early care and education literature and try to condense it down into like four main points, these would be the main points that I would, that I would pick. Um, the first few years of life are crucial for setting a strong or fragile foundation for all later learning, well-being, and happiness. Now I'm going to show you some slides here. This is a slide that some of you may have seen before. This is a slide that's based on some work in the Romanian uh, orphanages, looking at children, three-year-old, um, raised under normal social interaction circumstances versus extremely neglected. Um, and then you can see the differences not only in, in the size of the brain, but also in terms of the amount of empty space for the ventricles, you know, here versus in here. You can even, if you were looking at it, you had higher resolution, you could see just the density of the mass of the brain and what's inside of it. I mean, real true implications of just how we interact with young children, starting at their very birth. Now, you also heard earlier too, some, some talk about neuronal development. And I'm not going to go over it too much except to say this. Not only is it important to think about synaptic development and the fact that we have these neurons all over the brain, as Marianne was talking about before, that are making connections, but as she also said, there's pruning that happens, and that pruning happens when those connections aren't actually being used. The, the brain is exceedingly dynamic. It rewires itself. It builds itself for the environment in which it is placed and for the environmental demands in which that brain is placed. But what it cannot do is know what to expect four years, five years from now. And so if a child is talked to and is developing lots of connections in order to be able to facilitate language development, to be able to facilitate and negotiate social circumstances, that's terrific. And that will help that child immensely when that child gets into school. And if that child is not in an environment, or there's a lot of language, or a lot of social interaction. There's no way for that brain to know that that child will need to have those connections for about years from now. And so what happens is those connections then get pruned. And by pruning, I mean literally, kind of like on a tree, cut the dead branch off, and it's no longer there. And then they need to be reconnected. If they do get reconnected later on, through lots of complicated, extensive, costly interventions, such as remedial education, special education, those kind of connections will probably not be as efficient as they would have been at birth. Why? Because the brain now has to rewire around the other things. And so the wiring itself is not quite as efficient as it was before. It's interesting to think about it from that perspective. When we call it special education, when we call it remedial education, and we have lots of other different names, what it really, truly is, is neurological rehabilitation. And this neurological rehabilitation that could have been prevented, should have been prevented, and would have been easier to have prevented than to remediate later on. Um, next thing. The family is the child's first and most important teacher. I 
that's the number, number two thing that I'll tell you that we've worked over the past four or five decades of research on this. Babies come pre-wired for a lot of stuff. If you hold a baby, newborn baby up by the hips, and the feet are just barely touching the ground. Newborn baby. But what will happen? Any guesses? Is it timid guesses? <laughs> You, you, you might see, you might see something like this. And people refer to it as the walker reflex. Mm -hmm. Now anybody, like I give, I give a talk about, in my home state of Kentucky, in Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Ra raise your hand if you're representing Kentucky. Wow, hold on. That's a lot. That's, that, no, that's amazing. Thank, I'm glad that you guys are here. <laughs> How many here are here from Eastern Kentucky? Hey. Really? <laughs> name, name out of county. Wolf. Wolf County. Greenup yeah. County. Where? Greenup County. Greenup County, up near uh, Ashland. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Madison County? Madison County, uh, you have Berea College there, which is part of the consortium, yeah. and you also have Eastern Kentucky University, which is where I got my bachelor's degree. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's great, it's great, great to see you here. I, I, I'm sorry for the distraction. It's like a, it's like a family reunion. Okay, so so when I was in Kentucky and I was given this presentation, I, I, I asked, and it was a it was a fairly big audience. I said, and, and I was talking about the Walker reflex and everything. And I said, how many people uh, know much about horses or around horses? And of course, there's lots of hands. One, it's a wolf. You know, it's where they run the Kentucky Derby. How many people have ever? You know, and usually when I give this kind of a talk and I ask this kind of a question, I'm not going to get very many hands. But this was Kentucky and this was a wolf. I said, well, how many people have actually seen a horse born? And actually, quite a few people. <laughs> it's not a childhood education audience, but a bunch of people. Yeah, I've seen a horse before. How long does it take for that horse to get up and start running? Not long at all. Who taught it? <laughs> Did it watch a video? <laughs> Did it? Uh... Did it? Did it get a a a a a a, 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 a horse running curriculum? Uh, from <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of thing to think of. There are certain things, there's lots of things really, that we're kind of pre-wired to do, and we'll be able to do them if the circumstances allow. Now, why is it that babies don't just start walking? Because we're, we've got big, huge heads, and, it, and it's, it's hard for the baby to be able to hold that up and don't have a spring. And so they actually lose that reflex, they lose that skill. And then they have to relearn it to make her strong enough to actually. It's interesting to think about. There's certain things that you're born with, and they're in there for a reason. When babies are born, they typically have a, an area of vision that's about anywhere from six or eight inches to about 14 or 16 inches. That's what they can see. Anything closer kind of blurry, um, anything farther away uh, kind of kind of blurry. Um, the older I bless you, the older I get, the more I, I, get, I get like infant vision. <laughs> I have to like get the, just the right distance the right before I can see it. Babies, when they're born, they it's a fairly narrow distance. And when you think about, you know, what is that distance? That that sweet spot of what they can really see, which is about like six or so inches up to about fourteen inches. It's about the distance of this. What they can see is they can see the eyes of the person who are taking care of them. Whether that is a mother who is breastfeeding or a father, and I don't know how many, how many of you thought of what fathers or have been fathers? So you, you, you know the, the football carry, you know, so, you, you know so, so when you have the football carry, you may be just perfectly positioned, or, or the football would be also perfectly positioned to, 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 to see you, to see you quite well. You know, that's, 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 I mean, it's, it's interesting when you think about it. Their eyes are coming out perfectly designed to zero in on what is really, truly important in their world. Social connections. Connecting with some kind of an adult. If you take a baby, a baby who's a few days old, a few weeks old, 
lay the baby down, and you give the baby pictures to look at, and you're trying to look at which one will they fixate on. And say, for instance, you give the baby a picture of a face or a picture of a car. Which one will the baby turn towards? Face. face. What if it's a picture of a face or a really fancy car? Mercedes. <laughs> and like a, like a, I don't know, what's even fancier than Mercedes? What? <laughs> Ferrari? Yeah, okay, a Ferrari. What will, they, what will the baby want? The Ferrari or the, or the face? Right. What if it was a, a face? What if it was like a, a circle with dots and a, and a smiley thing or, 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 or like a, just like a, like a circle? The thing that looks more like the face. What if it was a circle or a square? It's interesting. Babies will typically prefer from a very, very young age anything that resembles in any way a face. They come out designed for that. They're pre-wired for that. They're pre-wired to make connections. And fortunately, we as parents become rewired when we give birth. Uh, mothers typically get that little kick of oxytocin. You've heard of oxytocin before, right? Some people call it the cuddle hormone. You know, it pops into you and it makes you want to protect someone, uh, take care of someone. Uh, it spikes during delivery. Um, we sometimes stimulate delivery by the use of Pitocin. You've heard of that, right? It's a synthetic version. Basically tricks the body into making you give birth. You know? What's interesting that a lot of folks don't know is this. Women are not the only people who have oxytocin in their system. They just basically have more of it than men do. And fathers have a spike in oxytocin too at the birth of a baby if he was there to see it. You know? It's amazing how babies, for the most part, come out wired up for all the things that they need. And we, if we can let it happen, come become wired to some degree. There was a study that was done by Arthur Reynolds. Um, he was interested in, in parent involvement, the importance of parent involvement in understanding the effectiveness of early education programs. So he did a structured equation model looking at basically the two prevailing <coughs> theories at this time. That maybe preschool programs are effective at, at helping children do better later on because it helps get them ready for school. There's a cognitive boost at kindergarten, and as a result, that is related to grade six achievement, or maybe the preschool program is always related to parental involvement because it's kind of hard to go to preschool and your parent not be involved at least to some degree because if you're three, how are you going to get there? <laughs> some degree of opportunity for parental involvement that exists in the preschool programs that might actually be avoided to some degree in the, in the elementary schools. And so the idea basically was well, perhaps Perhaps preschool programs get parents more involved. And as a result of having parents more involved, that involvement is also related to more involvement that continues over the course of that child's elementary school and might be related to grade six achievement. And they found evidence of about an equal size path in, in both directions, only a little bit more for the cognitive side in at least this part right here. Um, but nonetheless, certainly highlighting the importance of, of, of parental involvement. When we think about school readiness, typically people think about what? They think about what can we do for young children in order for them to have the skills they need in order to be able to succeed when they get to kindergarten. But we typically don't think about it from this perspective also. What about parent-family readiness? What can we do for young children to help their parents be more ready for the school experience? How to advocate for their child, how to understand what the relationship is that they need to be having with this teacher who's going to be taking care of their child, and, looking after this child's best educational interest. We don't typically think about school readiness either. Also, I think, from the perspective of what can schools do to be more ready for the diversity of the children that are going to come to that school. I mean, school readiness is not just about, God, God bless the poor babies who have to take all the weight of school readiness and all the weight of accountability and shoulder them on their own shoulders. You know, school readiness is more than about just how do young children do when they get to school, but also about are the parents ready and are the schools ready to receive them? But I think we sometimes don't think about it as much as we should. Number three, children learn through relationships. I'll give you an example through language. Um, this one came from, from a dear friend of mine who was just uh, mentioned very earlier today, Ami um, Clinic, who's at the Marcus Center on Autism here. He used to be at the Child Study Center at Yale, and he worked with good friends there and still good friends. And, 
he uh, he had this one description that he used to use, and I loved it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna mention it to you to you here. But it's not it's not really plagiarism because it wasn't actually given a you know present in a, in, a, in, a, in a convention eight years ago. So so, so none, nonetheless. So Ami Ami said. Imagine, you know, and this this is this happens. You've got the baby, and the baby is sitting on the high chair, and 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 and, and here's here's the the, 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 the the juice or the milk or the water. Or the juice. Milk or the water or something like that there. And 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 there's there's dear old dad. And uh, so the baby one day, maybe one day, goes and, and we're talking somewhere around. Seven, eight years old, or seven, eight months old. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there, and the baby goes, uh, uh, uh. and what does dear, because you're not, you're not just dad, you're dear dad. What does dear dad do? I had to uh, get in the hands of the bottle. Yes, absolutely. And then Tuesday, uh, 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 uh. what do you do? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. He never gets tired. <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> and then Thursday comes and it's oh, oh, oh. It's interesting. How many of you have ever had a child been in a house with a child? How many of your parents ever had a child? How many <laughs> How many of you have ever been a child? <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see. I mean, sometimes these things, it just happens in, in, in very quick ways. And in some cases, it's the little subtle things that you might miss are really the most dramatic moments. That little moment when it goes from uh, 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 to uh, 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 looking right at you. <laughs> right at you. You know what that is? That is the beginning of because I might not have the word for water, but I do know this. I know that he has a theory of mind. He can do things and he can think things differently than me, and he has capabilities, and I can use him as a tool. I know it sounds terrible. <laughs> and I can, I can reach for this, but not really, <laughs> and convey to you what it is that I'm wanting to do, and you'll understand it, and you'll get it for me. But why does that happen? It happens because it happens within the context of a social relationship that's been created because I know I can rely on you. I don't need to communicate with you if I don't know I can rely on you. I mean, babies, babies do this all the time to test out cause and effect, and as we play along with them, they develop a relationship with us, and then they get a sense of theory of mind. Baby drops a spoon, climbs on the ground, didn't really mean to, you pick it up, you give it to the baby, baby looks at it, <laughs> looks at you. <laughs> and you know, you and like Kelly like Dan said Wednesday. <laughs> we get back up, you know. These kind of games are really important. Um, mom, dad, with the baby, and the baby, you know, they are babbling, you know, you know, and the baby goes, and then then dad goes, and then the baby goes, and and it's some, you know, you ever watched this between parents and babies before? Like, who, who's training who in that? I mean, it's an interesting thing, you know, when you kind of see this thing happen, you know, when you realize that the baby's wired to do this, and we 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 may not have been wired, but we become rewired to reciprocate that and become a, a part of that. In the process of becoming a part of that, those neuronal connections are being made and being strengthened. And if it isn't happening, they're getting hurt. And then it comes along kindergarten several years later, trying to rebuild it and build around the highways that have already been built through the neighborhoods that could have had those neurons in them. Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button. Number of words of you know a big huge explosion after about 12, 18 months. Does that mean that at 12, 18 months that's when children first have language development? Yeah, not really. I mean, you saw this slide right here. I mean, what's interesting about the Hart and Risley study? I mean, you have to also. I mean, here's the caveat: just so that you can be 
very knowledgeable about this. I mean, it, it was a very small sample, and it was all in the Midwest, you know. But aside from that, it was certainly some very important findings in terms of like thinking about the number of words that children hear. But the number of words that those children were hearing were typically words that they were hearing as part of a relationship with their parents. And so the, really the findings are about how, what is the relationship with the number of words that a child hears in the course of authentic, real relationships with people. Not necessarily any kind of video games that are designed to dispose them to words or any particular kind of infant, um, infant curriculum. Uh, how many people know the name Lev Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist? You know, this is very famous. They said, thank God that we don't have a program designed specifically to teach children how to talk. Like we have programs designed specifically to teach them how to word, read, because if we did, they'd never say a word. <laughs> and it's, it's interesting to think about. I don't know if I completely agree with that, but it's got a point. I mean, there's an awful lot of learning that happens by the sheer volume of modeling opportunities. And some of the times we forget about the size of that. Like children who are hearing a lot of language, they're hearing a lot of language. And the size difference between that and the children who are not hearing much is pretty small. And some of the times you have to wonder exactly how good of a curriculum do you have to have to, on its own, as a curriculum that's going to be implemented in a finite amount of time by a teacher, how much of that and how good of that would you have to have in order to, be able to overcome all of that other deficit? You know, maybe there's room also to think about well, what else can we do to be able to make all the environments that our children have as language rich as possible in every single way so that there's never really a moment lost in terms of the language opportunities. Um, I think I've heard that you had Patricia Poole here in April, right? But most of you were here, right? Good. So I can tell. <laughs> so she's from the uh, University of Washington, or Washington University. I keep confusing the two. She's in the one that's from Washington State, not, not St. Louis, University of Washington. So she was interested in how babies learn how to, do, uh, how, how to, how to, how to understand language. And I, and, I, and I don't know if she mentioned this particular piece of research, and if she did, let me, let me know because I'm curious. But, but I, I think it's one of the more fascinating things that she's done. She was interested in how do children learn, or what are children's capacities for being able to differentiate different kind of speech sounds? And when does that develop, and what's that like in really, really, really young children in infants? And so she, um, she wanted to make different kinds of speech sounds, like vowel sounds, and then alter them in different directions, and then see, could the baby hear these minute differences? Um, but the problem is when, you, when you're only six months old or thereabouts, it, it's hard for a six-month-old to say, that's different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I say, I say, it makes it kind of hard at the optometrist for this six-month-old also. You know, better or worse? Mm, better. You know, so they don't have that kind of language, so you have to develop some way for them to be able to communicate. So they use something called the head turn technique. Anybody heard of the head turn technique? Eh. Okay, so in, infant, infant people, infant researchers would know this. So the infant, the head turn technique basically is a way to, to give the baby a skill that they need in order to be able to participate in the research. So the baby's sitting here, and then they play, and the parent has headphones on to not be able to hear anything, and the examiner does too. And then they play different sounds, ba, 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 bee. Every time that this sound changes, this monkey or something in this box will light up and then play the symbol or do something just outrageous. And then the baby looks over there and smiles and it's like the bee's knees and the baby's just thrilled. And then it stops and then they go back to it. And then eventually it gets to the point, kind of like with the, with the juice, the baby anticipates. And then any time they hear a change in the sound, the baby looks over there to see if it's going to happen. Once that happens, then they can start to study. Because now they've given the baby a way to communicate with the researcher whether or not they can hear sounds whether those sounds are changing or different. And so what she did was she played different types of sounds that are in language and then measured the baby's ability to be able to pick up speech sounds. So she noticed that at about five and a half, six months old or something like that, baby's abilities actually got worse. And you know why? Because at that age, that's about the beginning when they start to lose the ability to hear speech sound differences 
and vowels and other sounds that are not in their native language that they're hearing at home. Which basically means we're born as universal language learners. And then by about six months, five and a half months, we become specialized learners. That's the effect of the environment. When do children learn how to speak? I don't know exactly when, but it's before five and a half months. But they're not able to do it yet. You see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with this, right? You know, so we need the, the early months are exceedingly important. It makes you wonder what it is that we can do. I mean, you, it's easy. I, well, I've given these talks before to early childhood educators. I say, well, what can we do? Uh, the children that we have are, 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 are three years old. And I said, yes, but their siblings are three months. You know, you're, still a, you're still the child's early childhood educator, and that means that you have a relationship with the family, and that means that you have some potentials to be able to actually work with these younger siblings who haven't even come to you yet. Lots of things that we can always be able to do. High quality early education has lasting impacts on later learning. Uh, you heard a little bit about this from, um, from Dr. Duncan earlier. Um, Perry Preschool Project, it's in Michigan, age 27. These are the cost benefit analyses in terms of like how many dollars went into it and how many dollars were saved by society later on when they did cost benefit analyses. These are the three studies that you will see cited the most when it comes to making the case for why early education is more than just altruism, but it's actually a, a public investment. Uh, this is the Heckman curve that you heard earlier about. Earlier about. Um, basically, Jim Heckman did some, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he did to come up with this. <laughs> He thought it up. I mean, to some, I, I'm not going to be able to say this, but it's really a meta analysis. He didn't really do that. But it's sort of like a theoretical curve. Is that fair? It's a theoretical curve that's somewhat based on, on the data that do suggest that, that investing earlier is going to give you more returns than just investing later on in life. If you're wanting to think about this as, as, a, as an investment. But, I mean, you can think about it as an investment, early education investment in many different ways. I mean, one, it's investing in the future workforce. What can I do for these babies to help them be able to make more money and cost society less later on? Um, it's also an essential support for the parents so that they can go to work. You know, so it's important for, for, for the, econ the econ economic situation in America in terms of it's just this child care benefit. What is the number one provider of child care in America? The public schools. We just don't think of it that way. You know, I mean, and, and that's an important role that that plays, you know. It allows parents to be able to go to work at least for nine months. <laughs> you know, during the summer, they may have to find some of uh, And also, early care and education is a major employment industry in and of itself. And the teachers typically don't get paid much money, which means that when they are getting paid in early care and education, they're not usually investing their money in, in off-seas investments in Cayman Islands. Uh, they're usually spending it immediately and locally. So you can also think about it as a stimulus. What's interesting about thinking about it in all these ways is one, it certainly sells for decision makers. But on the other hand, I, I find myself kind of wondering about, you know, do we have to always benefit doing something useful and important to children based on whether or not we think we're going to get something out of it later on? You know, it, like do we have to always commodify children in order to be able to think about whether it's just do I feed my child only because I know that they'll talk down on hospital bills later on? <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting thing to think about. I, I think about these things at night. Um, <laughs> early education quality and language development. Okay, when we think about early education quality and its impacts on children's language development, structural quality uh, matters, uh, group size, teacher child ratios, things like that. The data seem to suggest that structural quality might matter in part because it gives the potential, but it's not a perfect relationship, but it gives the potential that process quality could be better. Process quality is the actual teacher-child interactions. That's where children learn. Children don't learn on the basis of, of these countable things that governments care about. The most. They learn on the basis of the interactions that they're actually experiencing in their daily life. The idea basically, though, is that is that the first one, structural quality, puts a cap on how good process quality can be. But the first one does not guarantee the second one. So you can have, you can have fine or great structural quality, and the process quality is still not going to be good. But it would be very hard to have terrible structural quality and have great process quality. Because to some degree, it puts a cap on it. Another way to think about it, too, is in dosage, and I'll get to that in a second. 
some research done by Thaler and Mather. They're the only study I know of that's actually in a random controlled experiment and pair half-day programming to full-day programming to see which one works better. And what they did was they randomly assigned teachers to either teach a full-day kindergarten or to teach two half-day kindergartens, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And then they randomly assigned the children to attend the different classrooms with a double randomization. I mean, great, great science. What they found was that in terms of language development, the children who went to full-day kindergarten developed significantly more language over the course of the year than the children who went to the half-day kindergarten. They looked a little bit closer to try to understand why, and what they basically found was this. In the half-day kindergarten programs, and I think this would be true also for preschool programs, in the half-day kindergarten programs, they typically have many of the same elements that the full-day program have, but they compressed it into a smaller period of time, which means that a much bigger portion of the day was spent transitioning from one thing to the next, which cut down on the amount of language opportunities that the children have for language exchanges because they were spending most of the time just hearing people say, stand in line, do this, do that. You see? You know, so basically, the dosage here changed the quality of the experience that the children were receiving. You know, much more perfunctory, less authentic. Uh, mixed SES versus all poverty preschools. A woman named Carlotta Schechter, Beth Bai. Beth Bai is an interesting person. She used to work, she's, they're both from Connecticut. Beth Bai worked at a lab school preschool program in Connecticut and then became a state legislator and then became the Secretary of State and then now I'm back in, in legislation and uh, appropriations. And so she's been a huge advocate for early education program. She and Carlotta did a study where they were interested in looking at the language effects of high-quality preschool programs on poor kids in two different conditions. Poor kids who went to a preschool program for only poor kids attended. Or poor kids who went to a preschool program where at least 70% of the children in the classroom were not poor. So in other words, how much effectiveness is there of preschool programs if you're in a all poverty versus in a mixed SES for the poor kids. And they try to contain, to some degree, it's not perfect, to some degree, they try to contain the level of quality by having, making sure that all the classrooms were in USC accredited programs, but you didn't have any particularly low quality programs. And what they found was that the children who attended the mixed SES programs developed significantly more language development as measured by the PPBT R and the Expressive One Group. Than the children who went to the all or classrooms. And when they started looking a little bit closer at the experience of the children, basically they came to the conclusion that's actually quite defensible by some other research that people have done, and that's that the vast majority of the language that children hear in preschool classrooms do not come out of the mouths of adults. They come out of the mouths of other children. You know, and so especially if it's a good one. You know, like if the vast majority of the words that a baby hears or a child hears in a preschool classroom is coming from the adult, that is not a good thing. That is not a good sign. You know, it's a sign that basically the teachers and the staff have not watched the Rollins Center video. <laughs> because if they had watched that, then that wouldn't be the case, right? So anyway, that's what I can tell you about early <laughs> education. Um, but there's one group of kids uh, for which they never benefit for early education. And that's the group of kids that Dan was talking about earlier, the group of kids who are expelled from preschool because of a challenging behavior. I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but knowing that Dan was going to mention it, I thought I should probably say a few words, and we're continuing to work on this. It was a study that I put out back in 2005. This was the first study to actually nationally document the rate at which children were being expelled from preschool programs. Uh, it was a fairly large study, about 4,000 randomly selected classrooms across the nation in all the 40 states that have a state funded pre-K program. At an 81% response rate, which is Charles Critic for this kind of research. I mean, typically, typically you'll live with 20 to 40 percent, you get 60 percent, you write home mom. Uh, so 81 percent is great. And we what was interesting about it, we were surveying, it was a computer assisted telephone interview. So we we used a political polling group and their equipment. And then I hired my own staff and we leased their facility from them for 18 months uh, during a non-presidential election period. <laughs> and, then we, and then we ran the study out of there. And what was interesting is, you know, when, when, you, when you call teachers up and you talk to, to preschool teachers, 
You know, I had to, and I know this is going to sound silly, but it's, it actually is true. We had to eventually get to the point where we had to train our research staff that was on the telephone with them on how do you politely get off the phone with a preschool teacher? <laughs> because they were asking all kinds of questions about, about you know, what's your job like, and job stress, and why are you in this in the first place, what do you keep, what's your hopes, and, and a lot of other things too having to do with like the day-to-day -day operations in the classroom. Maybe. But, but once they started asking them about real personal level human things, it's amazing how well people wanted to talk. I mean, they told us what their family income was and how much money they make on their particular job. They filled out a depression scale for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing, really, how much preschool teachers will talk if they feel that there's another adult who cares about what they're doing. You know, it's just one of, the, one of the things that you'll probably never see in a report that we write about, but is certainly, to me, one of the most important findings of the whole study. So anyway, you'll see where the classrooms are. Many of them are in public schools, but a lot of them work in public schools. And the question that we asked them was, over the past 12 months, have you ever terminated participation of a child from your program because of a challenging behavior? Do not include children who have transitioned directly from your preschool program to a therapeutic preschool program, a special education program, or some other potentially more appropriate setting. That's what we asked. And then the results that we found was that 10% of the teachers in the state-funded pre-K programs, those in the public schools, said yes, in the past 12 months, we have permanently terminated participation in at least one child. Uh, the number of children in the past 12 months was anywhere from one child to sometimes two children to sometimes three children to sometimes four children. When we piloted this, we piloted it in a survey of child care, not pre-K program, but now child care programs that are less structured, less, um, less supported out in the, in the community in Massachusetts. We did a statewide uh, study there, and it was statewide and randomly selected. Uh, so randomly selected by geographic site across the state. And we had one teacher who reported expelling six children out of a class of 16 in the course of 12 months. You know, when you see things like that, you have to think there, there's probably factors at play that are not just the child. You know, there's other things that might be at play here that would cause this. So this is what we found. When we did the math on it, because we knew how many children were enrolled in these classrooms, we found that there was about seven children expelled per thousand enrolled, or seven expulsions, I guess, per thousand enrolled. And so the question is, is that a lot? Is that a little? We found out that the U.S. Department of Education had collected data on expulsion two and suspension for grades K through 12, but they never collected it on preschoolers. But they also never analyzed it. And it existed at the U.S. Department of Education's website at 16,000 different databases, one for every school district in America. So we downloaded the 16,000 databases and we wrote our own formulas to be able to compute out the state level rates for each state and the national rate. And we could have something to compare it to. And when we did that, the K through 12 rate was 2.1 per thousand, and that's when we knew that we had our headline, which is that preschoolers are expelled in the United States at a rate more than three times that grades K through 12 combined. So when you have something like that, you got a headline, and then it becomes important to be able to go forward with it. But when you look at the research on child care and the rates of exposure in child care, it is way higher. So when you get out of the more regulated field of the public school programs where they have access at least occasionally to school psychologists and guidance counselors and, and, and school social workers, special ed departments, and you get out into these child care programs that are really provided very, very, very little support. And the rates are much, much, much higher. And you can, of course, figure out where the hot spots are. Um, the states in red are the ones who have the highest exposure rates. Uh, Connecticut was one of them. Uh, Georgia is pretty high, but not, not, not as high as Connecticut. But if, if, you, if you work on it, you'll catch us. Um, the states in the light blue have the lowest expulsion rate. Uh, the ones in white, uh, actually I suppose have the lowest expulsion rate, because they didn't expel any children, because they don't have any pre-K program in their state from which to expel them. <laughs> but the other ones, the other ones have, have expulsion rates. Except for Kentucky. I mean, this is an interesting story for, for, for Kentucky. <laughs> Kentucky was the only state of all 40 states that have a statewide pre-K system that reported zero expulsions. But it was also the only state whose state funded pre K program for poor kids, for low income kids, was created at the same time that states were, were building Part C programs, or Part B programs for, for preschool special ed. 
And so Kentucky was building its state funded pre-K program at the same time they were building the preschool special ed program. The preschool special ed people said, we would like to have some reverse mainstream kids in there. And the low income pre-K programs needed to have a place to actually operate and needed to have an infrastructure. So they literally put the two together. And so in Kentucky, at least for the several years at the very beginning of it, the, the state funded pre-K program and its special ed system ran together which probably gave those low-income children access to a whole lot more resources than they would have otherwise. And it probably also did this. It probably created an ethos within the program where they didn't even think that expulsion was possible or allowable because it's hard to justify expelling a child, denying, we can say for what it is, it's hard to justify denying access to education to a child on the basis of that child displaying his or her disability. And so within special education, it's a little bit harder to make that call, and it opens you up to a whole lot more potential for litigation. You know? And so it's also possible that it just wasn't even part of the conception of what would be possible in Kentucky. Either way, it was sort of an interesting story. The, the states that it's the highest, they, they stole the day in terms of the media coverage, and nobody, nobody heard any stories praising Kentucky. But, but Kentucky was the only state that, that didn't. We can, when you look at the data, there were some things that we found. Uh, in mixed age groups, four-year-olds were 50% more likely than threes. Boys two and a half times as likely than girls to be expelled. African Americans expelled twice the rate of non-African American children. You'll see some pictures here. These are sort of like images in newspapers when they ran the story. I just sort of click them so you can see what it's like. We put pressure through some groups that I work with, um, in, in particular the Congressional Black Caucus to put pressure on the U.S. Department of Education to start collecting data on this. So in 2008, I started working with a man named Danny Davis, who was a member of the, of the Congressional Black Caucus. He was a member of Congress on the Congressional Black Caucus and also on the House Education Committee, who was exceedingly interested in these data. And he was interested in the impact of this for particularly African-American boys in the educational system and for understanding why it is that many of their African-American boys were, were parents of poor or later on. And so we started working together. He started putting pressure on the, on the U.S. Department of Education to start collecting this data, too. And when they started collecting this data, they found these findings in 2016, just recently. And then two years ago, they pretty much had the exact same findings. Again, highlighting these huge disparities on the basis of gender and on the basis of race. And when you dig a little bit deeper on the basis of gender and race, when you, when you combine them together. So when you really put it, all together, the three big risk factors for expulsion in preschool are big, black, and boy. Those are your three risk factors. If you got one of them, you're at risk. If you got two of them, you're at high risk. If you got three of them, you're at exceedingly high risk. Those are the risk factors. Now, if we go a little bit farther, there's other things too that are factoring into it. Uh, teacher to child ratios the more children per adult, the more likely the child is going to be sent home. It's an interesting thing to think about in a way it corrects the ratio problem. You know, it's, you know, so if we don't have decent ratios to begin with, we sort of correct them on the side. Uh, length of day, longer term programs are open more hours, expel at a higher rate. Uh, job stress, teachers who screen positive for depression expel at a much, or who, who screen positive for job stress, elevated job stress, expel at a much higher rate. And, um, and teachers who screen positive for depression expel at twice the rate of teachers who screen positive for uh, here's a cartoon. Today we're going to explore and paint how we feel when we're picked up late for preschool. Uh, that's, that's job stress. Um, let, me, um, let me play you some sound of what job stress sounds like. We're talking about language development here, right? So if we're talking about language development, what does a teacher with elevated job stress sound like? At home, four-year-old Megan is like any little girl her age. She likes to play and loves her kitten, Jiminy. It's what was happening at school at Memorial Elementary that has had her parents Puzzle. She's been having some behavioral problems in class, um, but the behavioral problems that we're getting described are not things that she does here at home. So after months of wondering why, Diane and Oscar Mijadas have spent 50 bucks on a digital recorder, put it in Megan's backpack, turned it on, and sent it to school. And this is just a sampling of what they heard. I can 
believe it. The couple was stunned. This was a veteran teacher talking to four and five-year-olds and sometimes singling them out. They took the recording to the principal, who in a statement to us called the comments, quote, reprehensible and totally unacceptable. He writes he immediately removed the teacher from the classroom and reassigned her as the investigation continues. But Megan's parents say the district has an obligation to keep this. From continuing, I really don't feel like she should be teaching anymore. Every time that I show this and they say and reassign her, obviously this hey, yeah. <laughs> comes back to me from the audience. It's interesting to think about too, you know, because I mean it does sound kind of silly. I mean, if, if she's having these challenges in this class, why reassign her to a different classroom with kids? But when you also think about it, you know, preschool expulsion is that too. Children, I mean, like. At about six months old, we get a sense of object permanence. If I hide something from the baby, the baby knows that it still exists, and I can lift up the, 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 the wash rag and then it will still be under there. You know, but somehow, between six months and when we become teachers and administrators, we lose our, our sense of object permanence, and we believe that when a baby or a child is expelled from a program, they cease to exist. They don't cease to exist. They just go to a different program. And so preschool expulsion itself is just reassignment. The child is not going to be in your classroom anymore, but they're going to be someplace else in the system because mom and dad have to go to work. And so they're going to have to find the child here and the child going to be in work someplace else. I was at a meeting with some philanthropists, and this one philanthropist fellow that was there, he was a family member of a foundation, and he, he, was, he was playing devil's advocate. And he said, you know, look, don't you ever get concerned about the kids who are in the classroom who have to put up with these children? And I said, well, don't you ever get concerned about the children in the classroom that that child's going to end up with? when he gets expelled from there, and then the next one, and then the next one, you know, the real issue here basically is providing services now when the issue is relatively small or small in comparison to how big this issue can be instead of just waiting for problems to fester and become more recalcitrant and difficult to deal with later on. Uh, in other words, many factors are not, that are not child behavior to predict preschool expulsion. All of these different things that we mentioned. And also access to resources and supports like early child mental health consultation. Teachers correlationally in this national study, if they had access to someone who could be a coach in the classroom. And I love the Boston video, but my money is on this. My money is that the thing in Boston probably most likely to be leading to their impacts is probably having access to that coach. Mm -hmm. Having somebody in there who's coaching the teachers on a regular basis. In this model, we have early childhood mental health consultants, mental health folk that are social emotional coaches to teachers who would come into the classroom and work with the teachers. And in the national study, correlationally, teachers who had access to a coach were, were expelling at about half the rate of teachers who didn't have access. So in Connecticut, we created a statewide system of early childhood mental health consultants that utilized mental health consultants that were already in the community, gave them the skills they needed in order to be consultants in these classrooms and then dispatch them to classrooms whenever the teachers had concerns about a child's social emotional development or behavioral concerns were especially if they were thinking about expelling or suspending the child from the program. And because the program was very successful in terms of getting its, 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 uh, its, its services out there, it was running a wait list, which allowed us to then be able to do a statewide rate of control trial. And we've now done three statewide random control trials of this program in Connecticut, and the the, the cleanest of those is coming out in the Journal of the American Academy of Child Medicine and Psychiatry in September, um, showing positive effects for the program overall. And what's nice about this was that it, it, it wasn't a, a, random, a random control trial of a hothouse program where it's in a small scale in implemented or ideal conditions. This is a random control trial during full statewide implementation. When you compare the cost of this, to anything else that a school could do, such as the cost of special education placement, or the cost of grade retention. Grade retention costs money. It costs the exact amount of how much it costs to educate a child per year. And then you're going to have to repeat that grade. Or the cost of outpatient psychotherapy. Certainly a very, very, very cheap intervention. You know? So we're happy about that. But when you look at all of these kind of findings, you certainly come to this kind of a conclusion. Principal expulsion is not a child behavior. It's an adult decision that might be based in part on the behaviors of the child, but also have a lot of other things that are factors as well. Which raises the question, you know, why are our African-American children, our boys, and in particular our African-American boys, more likely to be expelled? 
We can put it within the context of all that. And we know that things like pitch boys are more susceptible to stressors than girls are. Uh, children of color often have more stressors because they're more likely to live in low income communities that have lots of stress in it. Children of color often attend programs that are poor quality and have fewer resources. These are all the sad truths that go along with race and socioeconomic status in our country. Yet when I even add all of these up together, it doesn't seem to fully account for the degree of disparities that we're seeing, which is really quite high. I mean, we were finding two to one in 2005, and the U.S. Department of Education is now saying it's probably closer to like 3.6 to one, the rate of African American expulsions in three, for three roles over white children. And so when you look at all of this, you have to think, well, what else could possibly account for it? Which has led us lately to be looking more and more at implicit biases and the role of implicit biases in teachers who are well meaning people who are doing God's work and don't necessarily even know that they have these biases that might have an impact on the way in which they're interacting. We know from several different studies things like black boys are more likely to be suspended or expelled for similar behaviors in elementary school, correlational research. We know about biases regarding black boys. There was a study done by Gulf. Goff, who took vignettes of children who were about 10 years old, and these were vignettes where the child may have done this misdeed or may not have, and it's kind of hard to tell. And then they gave different pictures of different children that came that went along with the vignette. And they asked the people who were looking at these, how likely do you think the child did this bad thing? How culpable is this child? And if the picture that was being paired with the story was a picture of an African American boy, culpability rates were much, 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 much higher. The details were identical. So in the Skiba story here, this is correlational because, and you can never really tell, oh, maybe there's some other extenuating circumstances that are kind of small, and it might be the same infraction, but maybe the African American children had a longer pattern of these kinds of behaviors. <laughs> But not in the case of golf. Everything is identical. The only thing that's different is the color of the skin on that child. And the culpability was seen as significantly different. Let me tell you something else that would be found. They then asked them, all the kids were about 10 years old. They asked them, guess how old the kid is? And they overestimated the African American children by an average of about four and a half years their age. Fascinating, isn't it? Remember what I said before about risk factors? Three of them, big black boy. You know, so if we look at our African American children and we see them as bigger, scarier, more likely to hurt our frailer, whiter children, you know, the, the potential that they could have an impact on the way in which we view that behavior and what that behavior might mean can, can be quite large. So a study going by door that was really interesting just a couple of years ago. And this was a study with, with children to see at what age do implicit biases happen. She had, they have five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds in the study. And they had the children rate pain. And so they said, imagine you hit your head. How much would that hurt? And they gave them a scale to rate it on. Imagine you stuck your toe. How much would that hurt? Imagine you bit your tongue. How much would that hurt? And then they had them look at pictures of children, and they said, he stubbed his toe. How much did it hurt? She hit her head. How much did it hurt? And what they found was, at about five years old, no significant differences. By about seven years old, significant differences in that the African-American boy was seen as feeling less pain. And by nine years old, significantly less pain. And really, when you think about this, friends, this isn't really a study of, of pain. This is a study of empathy. And that by the time that you become about seven years old, you become judicious in terms of for whom we will give our empathy and for whom we withhold our empathy. And that can have huge implications in terms of the rationale and the justifications that we may or may not be placing on the behaviors of the child when we see that child behave. Because empathy basically is a moderator, and it tends to moderate our assumed assumptions about what that child really meant when that child did that. Uh, expectancy biases. Uh, shifting standards theory is the thing that we focus on here uh, by Vernon. 
um, in expectancy biases. There was a study that was done by Harvard uh, with white English teachers, middle school and high school, and they wrote essays that were designed to look like C minus kind of essays. And when they wrote these essays, they gave them to the teachers and had the teachers assign a letter grade. But what they also did is they randomly changed the name at the top to either suggest an African American child, a Latina child, or a, a non Latina white child. And can you guess what the differences were in the grades? Like for the children of color, black, Latina, what would you guess? Did they get higher grade, lower grade? Mm -hmm. Wrong. They got significantly higher grades. Not a little bit, a lot. Why? Expectations. Well, this doesn't look all that bad for a black kid. This doesn't look all that bad for a Latina. So it changed the way in which those expectations played out in terms of the way in which, in which they were appraising that behavior. It's not, it's not really all that kind to do that because it gives children a misguided sense of actually where they stand. And it ultimately undershows the kind of stereotype biases, basically expectancy biases or stereotype biases that are at play. And that may actually be also telling us not only about how they grade it, but how they interact and how they encourage children who may feel to have different types of abilities. Um, and, even if, and even if the stereotypes were accurate, it wouldn't necessarily mean that it's accurate for that particular child that they were grading. And that's when it becomes really damaging. You know, even if we have a stereotype that's based in, in some kernel of truth, and even if it were completely true, it doesn't mean that it's going to be completely true for every single person. But when we apply it that way, we then create the reality of the stereotype that we have in inside of our own head. And that's why it's important for all of us to become more, I think, familiar and understanding of stereotype biases. I'll tell you another reason that I care deeply about this. Remember the three studies that we talked about and, and, um, and uh, Dr. Duncan mentioned earlier too? You got that, the Perry Preschool Study, that's the most widely studied uh, early care and education program and build the case for early care and education programs in the United States. Number two, we have a Sigarian. Number three, Chicago Child Care Centers. A lot of people know a lot about these studies. They are the reason that we have the proliferation of early care and education programs in the world or in the United States today. Because we can then make the case that they're an investment. These are the three that are longitudinal and have cost-benefit analyses behind them. But the thing that a lot of people don't know is this. Perry Preschool Study, the most widely cited study in early care and education, 100% African American. Every single child in the study is black. Abyssidarian, 98%. Chicago Child Parent Centers, 93%. What we've basically done is we've taken data that belong to black children and black families and black communities, and we used it, fine enough, to justify the existence of a program for all of our children. But then, Nobody's really paying attention. We kick out the back door. The children who gave us the data in the first place that created the program. And that's a problem. It's a major problem. It's a, it's a, it's a return on investment problem. Why would you kick out the kids that you know are giving you the return on investment? I mean, you kick out the white kids. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if you look at it just in terms of the numbers. <laughs> But the other part of it, too, is that I mean, there's just like no way that that can be squared in terms of thinking about social justice or even just fairness at all in any kind of a way. You know, I, I need to cite those three studies because I talk about early care and education as an, as, as a, as an intervention, as an investment. I have to cite those studies. Those are things that I cite a lot. But I've decided a few years ago when I came to the understanding of this that I'm no longer going to cite Perry Preschool or Abyssidarian or Chicago Child Parent Centers in any paper unless I am willing and able to give an equal amount of time and effort to protecting the rights of the children who gave us those data in the first place. And if I'm not going to do that, then I have no right to cite those data because those data don't belong to me. They're not the data, they're the data that belong to these black children. That's how I am here the social justice element of thinking about early care and education, and we all have to think about that too. When we think about social justice, Sometimes it means a place on a bus or a family cabinet or 
could mean a place to vote, it could mean access to higher education, or the ability to go to an elementary school. You know, in this case, we're talking about the ability to go to preschool programs. And we have to think about the front door access, but we also have to think about the back door access by which children are sometimes pushed out. I'm not naive enough to think that every child is going to hit a home run in life, but I do believe that every child deserves a decent, a chance at the bat at the plate with a decent bat and a very pitch ball. And that's the idea behind the way for care and education programs. But if we kick the kids out that need it the most, we're not going to be able to do it very well. Uh, we've been working on a measure, I'm going to finish up real quickly, called the child. And the reason why is because we become more and more convinced in the work that we're doing, in the research that we've been conducting, and the research that we read from other people, that, that the, the healthiness of an environment is really dependent on a whole host of factors that also have to do with the healthiness of that environment for the adults. It's impossible for any kind of an environment to be healthy for children if it's not also healthy for the adults. And an environment that's unhealthy for the mental health of an adult is going to by necessity be unhealthy for the, for the children. When I flew here on the plane, I had to listen to the flight attendants say, in the unlikely event of a, of a, of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, which I promise that didn't happen, um, gas can be deployed from the ceiling. Please uh, secure your own mask before attempting to help others. And the video that they show you is, is, is a parent putting their mask on before they put their mask on, on the child. You know, and that's the same thing for our early care education programs and for our schools. I mean, it's not healthy for the adults. It can't possibly be healthy for, for anybody else. So we've created a measure we've been working on for several years now that looks at all kinds of things having to do with staff-child interactions and child-child interactions, but also staff-to-staff -staff interactions and how staff model. I've been to a lot of preschool classrooms where, where the teachers are concerned that the children don't seem to get along. And I watched the adults. Mm -hmm. and they don't seem to get along either. <laughs> <laughs> or I've been to classrooms where, where they're, they're concerned that the children always look angry and they're upset and everything. And I look at the teachers and they're all angry and upset too. You know, it, you know it's, it, if it's not healthy for the adults, it can't possibly be healthy for the children. You know? So we, we look at those things too, including subtle cues that teachers may or may not be picking up on. Um, and as also equity and inclusion kinds of issues in this measure. It's got 28 items in nine different domains. We look specifically at transitions. Because one of the things that we found is that the majority of challenging behavior that happen in preschool classrooms happen during transition moments. And yet most of the classroom observations that you see in the market have very minimal attention to the transitions. Why? Because it comes from an educational standpoint by which transitions are considered time off task to be minimized. And I can understand minimizing them, but you'll never eliminate them. And what they also provide you is extremely rich opportunities to engage children in language development and to engage children in social interaction. Um, and if we just think of them as, as something that we have to go through, we're missing opportunities to be engaging children. Uh, staff awareness, basically, kind the staff pay attention to one set of children and also be aware of what's going on someplace else in the room. Staff cooperation, how the che teachers and the staff get along and work together. I had a video, but I don't have time to show it to you. But it was a video that I was going to show you that shows the difference between two teachers over mealtime and their language use. It's a video that we use when we're training people on how to score this. The first step of the scoring is that you have to decide, is this teacher a baseline teacher? In other words, is this teacher nice? Or is this teacher undermining? development, or is this teacher facilitating development? We go with a baseline of just nice in terms of like, like what would Aunt Sally, who is a lovely, lovely, lovely person, be doing right now with these children? And is it there, or is it less than that, or is it actually Aunt Sally who knows what she's doing? <laughs> Who's actually really facilitating language and facilitating interactions with these children. And so what we had in the videos, you'd see two teachers interacting with children, and both of them were lovely and nice. And truly, were just lovely to the kids. And they would answer the children's questions. But one of them didn't just answer the question, they would build on it in ways that encouraged other children to be able to come into it 
And it would have been exceedingly easy for them to think of, this is the time when I just have to make sure that they eat their food. Can you please show up? And I, oh, I don't know. I've been told to get off the stage. <laughs> We're going to put it on your website. Well, I, actually, actually, I can't put it on the website. Maybe we're quiet because we don't have permission to show it on the website. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm thinking this is a, as a good vote of confidence. This is a... Go to Kentucky. Can you hear it? Keep eating your food, Alina. It tastes like juice. That's really healthy, right? They're crunchy. They're crunchy. You like the cheese now, too, right? Yeah, it might be someone outside and going home. Drink a little milk and have some more apple first, then you can have cheese. Embedded within the context of play, 
But it's really hard, it seems like, for many teachers to be able to think about it this way. Here, let, let's, let's do a real quick exercise, just really quickly. We're going to play a game of opposites. If I say left, you, then you've got to participate, okay? If I say left, you say right. If I say, good. If I say, if I say night, you say day. If I say work, you say Play. And that's the problem. Right there, that is the problem. And even educators. Like you guys, think of work and play of the opposite. And until we get to the point where we think and understand that play with young children can actually have a work result, we're never going to be able to see that as a vehicle. Basically, you take the vehicle of play, that is a fast-moving, strong engine with young children, and you place your agenda into that place so that it takes off. Instead of rubbing against the grain of the wood, you're now rubbing with the grain of the wood. Um, ignores um, most of the adults in the room, uh, like the class measure. How many people have heard of the class? You like the class? Um, one of the most popular measures on, on, on the planet right now for measuring early childhood environments is the class. And you rate the interactions from the perspective of the lead teacher in the classroom. And the problem that I have is with this. I've been in a lot of preschool classrooms, a lot, but I've never seen a preschooler in a preschool classroom that could correctly identify, or care to identify, the credentials of the adults in that room. And say, that's the lead teacher, but she's the para. <laughs> you know, from the perspective of the teacher, these are all just human beings that can have an authentic, real relationship in their life. But as long as we keep thinking about our rating systems from the perspective of the lead teacher versus the paras, versus the cook, or the janitor who has no particular role in this, as long as we see it like that, we're going to be missing every single opportunity we can have to be able to make this a much more rich kind of an environment. And most of our measures currently ignore issues of equity and inclusion. I used to believe a long time ago that in education, we measure the things that we value. But I've since come to believe it's truly the opposite. We just value the things that we measure. And if we want to change the way that people think about and frame issues, we have to change the measurements. And once we change the measurements, it's amazing how quickly people's thoughts change. Because now we've changed the whole schemata around what it is that we're thinking healthy interactions are in classrooms. If we think that healthy interactions in classrooms are just one-way interactions between a lead adult and children, that's one model. I just don't think it's a good one. And in order to change that, I think we need to change the measures because that's how you basically do it. And so basically, these are the three big main points. I would think you can leave them yourself. I think you already covered every single one of them. And then, over dinner, oh, and one of my inspirations for thinking about this stuff, love that video. Love it, love it, love it. And I was thrilled to be able to see what part two looks like. And to know that he's got a career um, and, and has, he, has he signed with an agent? <laughs> because I can, I can share my address and then he can contact me. Um, oh, last story I'll tell you, real quick. And then I, then I promise I'll get off the stage. So, I was going to the U.S., I was going to Congress to, 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 to testify for the U.S. House Appropriations Committee regarding early childhood programs. And this was a couple of years ago. And I stopped off at the deli. Uh, I live in Connecticut in a small little town uh, that is one of the few places left with, with, with farms. Uh, it's called Bethany, but we, we refer to it as Bethany. And, and so I was at the deli there, and I met um, uh, Dick Doolittle. He's a peach tree farmer. Uh, and he's famous in the community as being just the guy who knows the most about growing things, especially peach trees, but all things. I mean, he's just, he's, if you have a, a, a a pest problem, and you don't know what's causing the little bites on, on your roses, you know, he's the guy who would answer it. Dick Doolittle, and everybody calls him Dr. Doolittle because if your last name is Doolittle, you're going to be called Dr. Doolittle. And so I, 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 I said to him on my way, because I was just going to get like, like an egg sandwich, and I was going off to the airport to go to Washington, and I said, I got a question for you, Dr. Doolittle. He said, why is it? And I said, I said if, you, if you took the growing season for a for, for a peach tree, and you divide it into three periods. First period is when you put the seed in the ground until it sprouts up a plant. And the second period is when it grows from that sprout into a mature tree. And the third period is when it starts to bear fruit. 
And if two of those periods, you don't know what you're going to get in terms of weather. But one of them you can control. You can make the conditions optimal. Optimal amount of rain, optimal amount of sunshine. You can only control one, and the other two, who knows what you're going to get. Which one would you control? He wasted no time. He said, why the first one? And I said, why? And he said, because what happens in that first period sets all the potential for what could happen afterwards. And that's when I said, hot dog, I've got my line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.